rabbit encasing. Things got to be pretty close. Or, or, you, or you could just do it like that. I, I think I told you guys about that motel I was I stayed in once where they just ran the drywall right over the, the uh, jams to the doors and put the casing on afterwards so you could see the rough edge of the drywall. But... <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design talk that's aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by Rob Wadsack, Digital Brand Manager. Hey there. Matt Milham, Deputy Editor. What's up? And Producer Jeff Rose. Hey. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is a pleasure to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, man. It's good to be here. here. Matt, it's been forever since you've been on here. Yeah, that's what I'm told. What (laughs) have you been doing? (laughs) Uh, I've been out on a couple shoots and, uh, I don't know, working on the magazine. Adopted a couple rescue dogs. They take up a lot of time. So. Oh, tell us about your new pooches. Uh, they were, they came from North Carolina, as far as I understand. Do I they bark with a southern stuff. accent? Yeah, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> they only eat grits. <laughs> no, they're, uh, uh, what are they, like lab, sort of some kind of pit bull mix. And they're growing very rapidly. About Are they running <laughs> about your house crazily? Yeah, we have them kind of confined to the living room and... They enjoy it in there. They're actually pretty low key, even though they're they have like spurts. You know, they're puppies, so yeah. they're like they're just six months now, or they will. Oh, be so in they're the in week. the like huge paw phase of their lives, right? Yeah, they yeah. have <laughs> massive paws and like really gangly bodies, and they fall down a lot. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're they're almost forty pounds each, but they still just <laughs> have no coordination. It's pretty fun. It is fun. Yeah. Well, good for you, man. That's awesome. Yeah. What are you doing on the house? Uh, not much at the moment. Um, I just picked up, my parents are moving and the, my, there's not space for my dad to put any of his workshop tools. So last weekend I picked up his table saw, jointer, uh, planer and a uh, drill press and about probably two tons of, uh, <laughs> rough cut lumber. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff ahead of me, but so you know. did, did you, did you and he move that stuff together, or just you two? Uh, yeah, and my brother-in-law uh, helped me offload it, as did my wife. But yeah, it was only about an hour to offload all the stuff off the moving truck. But yeah, oh my god, it was so much you, harder getting it in. <laughs> you had to push this stuff up the ramp to get this in the truck, right? Yeah, exactly. Getting the planer up the ramp. I mean, it was it, it definitely near its limit. <laughs> As I was flexing like crazy, it looked like it was possibly going to snap, but we were probably safe. So, uh, are you going to set up a wood shop and make some furniture and stuff? Is that the plan? That's kind of the plan. The hope I got to expand the garage in order to make that happen. I think everything's on wheels so I can move it around, but that's kind of a pain in the butt to do with a table saw with all the extension tables and everything. So your garage is not conditioned, right? How are you going to keep all the stuff from rusting? Yeah. I don't know. I guess I'm gonna have to try to cover it somehow. You need some Cosmoline. Yeah. <laughs> well, fine, woodwork- jeeps. <laughs> fine Woodworking did an article, uh, probably more than once at least, uh, on uh, the different rust prohibited uh, mm-hmm. inhibitors that you can put on your tools. Um, I'll try to put a, put a link to that in the uh, in the notes. Tom the, McKenna uh, did that, right, too? And he actually like tested some like hardened uh, steel, some tool steel samples and spray them with different things, right? Yep. Yeah, that sounds about right. I haven't How seen cool that is already. that? <laughs> <laughs> so I also noticed, Matt, you you pointed out that you picked up a whole bunch of Taunton books from your from uh, that move too, didn't you? Um, yeah, yeah, I got a pile of books, and I don't. My parents didn't do this on purpose. This is all long before uh, you know I started working here. Um, but yeah, my dad's been a woodworker for I don't know as long as I've been alive, and he's just amassed a large collection of Taunton books. Um, this was just the latest pile of stuff I picked up. He'd given me a bunch of stuff in the past too, but yeah, probably, I probably have 40 Taunton books all predating <laughs> my time at Taunton. So that's cool. I mean, forever. 
our company has been the publisher of stuff for this craft, right? And uh, I, yeah. it, I mean, oh, I think all of us have those books prior to us working here, which is pretty cool legacy. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I knew about Taunton Books long before I even knew about Fine Home Building Magazine from early years of me being interested in uh, carpentry and and other crafts. So. Yep. Uh, the company founders have done a great thing. I, I think we would all agree. Definitely. Rob, what have you been doing? You've been fixing your kitchen, it looks like. I've, I've seen some updates. My kitchen. I've been fixing my kitchen. I, I, I've, I'm moving slow. You know, I, the, the last thing I think we saw was the drywall going up around the window and some air sealing with some of that uh, window and door foam so it doesn't seal my door up t- tight when I put it in there. Um, <clears throat> I wonder how many people know to, to use that specific foam when they're working around the jams of a, of a door, because if you it just only use... takes not using it once and then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so for anybody who's never done that, uh, um, if you go to the, 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 the great stuff, spray foam aisle, and they have all the different colored cans, make sure you get the, what's the blue one, I think is it's the called one for, window and door. Yeah. Window and door one, because if you don't, uh, that expanding foam might make it a lot harder for you to open your windows and doors after you fill the gaps around the jams when you're air sealing. So luckily I didn't do that. <laughs> um, but uh, honestly, it's it's just a lot of decision making. Like we were looking at uh, faucets and we went to the one of the local um, like really nice plumbing supply places in town here. And they really had You a, can say it. So was it Webb? Um, no, no, it was actually, uh, it's called modern plumbing. It's right in downtown, uh, New, New Milford, okay. but, um, they really, they, they pretty much have us sold on a $700 faucet for our <laughs> sink. And it's just amazing how, what do you think, Matt? Do you think the website <laughs> of the business is getting paid better than the rest of us on, you know, the other sides of the company? <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't actually <laughs> say I purchased it. <laughs> so then we were, you know, we're like, oh yeah, we want this. And, uh, cause you know what it is, it's like, you can buy a $300, faucet at a similar at a similar store and it's got like plastic parts and i'm like for three hundred dollars i wanted to be, i wanted to be, be be made out of metal you know and uh because the the sink we have now has all these pinhole leaks in it because the thing is practically made out of sheet metal the faucet well so mm-hmm. that's why they become plastic on the inside man is because the they don't corrode in the uh hard water yeah but you want to know what one of the best one of our favorite purchases we ever made, and we made it years before we even did our bathroom remodel, was we bought a solid brass, one of those nice old uh, faucets that has the two little knobs and it comes out of the back, you know, the back of the sink. And it just, it just feels so solid and it just works nice. And, you know, it's, it's a focal point in the room. And uh, there are very few things I would be willing to spend that kind of money on. We, we're not quite convinced yet. We think we found like a Three hundred dollar one from one of the big brands like Moan or uh, Kohler that we might buy instead, but I don't know. It's it's a it's it's like you know you it's one of those purchases that you 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 regret cheaping out on afterwards. I mean, I can cheap out on a lot of other things. Yeah, I totally agree, sure. and you use it all the time, every day, right? Yeah. It's not something that gets a very occasional use. It's getting constant use. Yeah. But those to me just seem like the biggest racket. Like I can't believe that it costs, you know, seven hundred dollars in materials and labor or whatever to produce one of those things. I mean, even if you like shipped it from Europe via pigeon, it wouldn't cost that much. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think when you got up into that price range, you're also paying for the name. You're paying for the designer. So you're, who is this? Whose yeah. faucet is this, um, Rob? The one that we're looking at is by a, a company called Frankie. I think it's how you pronounce it. It's F A R N A N K E, and uh, it just it just has such nice parts and action on it. It just feels like it'll last forever. Well, we bought a uh, I want to say it was like two hundred and fifty dollar Moen from the home center with a pull out spray. It's single handle, and as you suggest, Rob, all the guts are plastic, but uh, it works fantastic. And I can tell you, we wish we would have bought it years before because the pull out spray is amazing for rinsing out the sink and rinsing off dishes and stuff. Oh, Very yeah. handy. Jeff, what have you been doing? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, installed the spare dishwasher. Um, what? And- <laughs> you have a spare dishwasher? <laughs> Doesn't everybody, everybody have a spare dishwasher? That's my dream. Just take them out of one, use yeah. them, put them in the other. Matt probably has one on his Me too, porch. Matt. Yeah. 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 No, um, years, years ago, I was in Lowe's and walking by the 
discount appliances and there was a dishwasher. I don't remember whether it was five or $10. It was no more than 10. What? Whoa. Yeah. It's like, wait, wait a minute. Something's, you know, I'm missing a digit or something. Um, but, you know, it was definitely very cheapest brand, you know, model. Um, missing the bottom rack, had a couple of other things, but it's like, all right, $10, that's worth an afternoon's entertainment for me to see if it works. Oh, yeah. So I bought it and it's been sitting down in the basement. So, and it works fine. What <laughs> did you do, do about the missing rack? Uh, kept an eye out for one sitting at the curb and man i thought i was a scavenger <laughs> this is fantastic i think this is a feature article <laughs> i don't know if you guys uh, heard me talking about it uh you certainly didn't matt but i was uh uh talking the last time we recorded about my smoky lawnmower right and i was worried that worried that it had a blown engine because it, i I was running it around the, the the lawn and it was really like making clouds of smoke and smelling really bad. And um, I then thought about it a little longer and I was like, I bet there is a mouse nest in the engine uh, cover. And sure enough, I took it off on Sunday and there was a dead mouse and its nest under the engine. And uh, boy, it was great to find a result. And then it wasn't my engine was blown up. Ugh. And yeah. you didn't smell that in your barn or whatever? So, uh, the, the mower was outside, oh, okay. uh, and has been, it is my new roommate though, because I don't want to deal with this again. So the cub yeah. cadet is back into my workplace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you need to figure out a work table so that you can sit on it while you're, <laughs> I know that would be awesome. <laughs> well, Patrick, um, Patrick and I had some idea the other day, we're always sending car pictures back and forth and. Um, he sent me a picture of this mini with like a giant V8 swap in it. And one of those mini, like old classic British minis from the sixties or seventies. And I found one that was like a, a Ute, which is one of the little pickup truck models. And it had this nice hard tonneau cover on it. It would make a perfect desk. In, I in love it. Rob, I love it. I love those things. There's something super cool about those little cars. Yep. Uh, we got some good feedback this time. We should, we should get to it. This comes from, uh, Andrew in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Uh, howdy FHB crew. I want to thank you for your feedback on my detached garage insulation project back in episode 192. What I learned from you enabled me to simplify my, my approach and put together a functional workspace before my twin boys were born this June. Frankly, you also saved me a pile of money. I might have wasted chasing unreasonable, unnecessary performance characteristics for a wood shop with a leaky roll up door, two by six rafters and a flat roof. I ended up getting the walls and ceiling sprayed with a flash coat of closed cell foam to help keep the drafts out, filled the cavities with cheap-faced fiberglass bats, and covered the walls and ceiling with plywood. It might not be perfectly cozy during our Cleveland winters, but it will be comfortable enough to enjoy making sawdust. I've attached a couple photos. I've never met EMT before, if you were curious as to why it looks like a drunken metallic spider had its way with my walls. Keep craft alive, <laughs> Andrew. So Andrew sent us photos of his new shop and it looks like a great space, but even more awesome was he sent him uh, a photo showing him holding his twin boys, one in each arm. And they have the very sleepy, adorable baby characteristic that they have uh, when they're in the newborn phase. Yeah. Was that a professional photo? That was a, that was like the cutest photo ever. <laughs> I know, it was the yeah. cutest photo ever. <laughs> even wearing like what, a leather apron in it? Yeah. Yes. A woodworker's apron. <laughs> That's so when the kids throw up on them, you can wipe it off easy, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were really cute. Well, thanks, Andrew, and I'm glad it helped. I, You know, I think that's something that a lot of uh, folks are dealing with is, you know, you want to make a perfect space for your shop, but the real problem is the door. So what do you think about the flash and bat method, Matt, for your own space? That would be a good way to go, right? Yeah. The, the main thing is I need to figure out how to get... Uh, something on the ceiling because right now there are you know rafter ties roughly every four feet or something like that it's not enough to get anything you know attach anything to it so do you have ceiling joists at all or these are these are rafter ties high, higher up on the rafter no these are basically they would be like ceiling joists but you know it's what probably 10 foot walls and you know they're four feet on center it's uh, there's it's everything is open, you know, it's an open soffit basically. And, you know, so I have to do something to close that off and really at the ceiling plane is the easiest place, but I got to find right now the, you know, they used probably 26 foot, uh, 
two by sixes for those uh, ceiling joints. Ceiling joints. Oh wow! So wow, that's that's that. <laughs> that's a span. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I think it would hold up the ceiling, but geez, I don't know how you're going to find lumber that long. Yeah, go to, go to the local mill and get some something milled up for you. Yeah, well, I'm probably just going to end up splitting the span, and I just got to figure out how to get that beam in there. So we'll see. You have, 10 foot, you have 10 foot walls, so you're going to have reasonable height, ceiling height in there, eh? Yeah, except that, you know, the garage door itself is, you know, much lower than that. So right. that really eats into it. Ah, so our next feedback comes from Paul. Hey, Patrick and crew, after your listener question in episode 281 about blower door testing for energy audits, I nearly pulled my car to the side of the highway to defend my fellow Massachusetts energy auditors and weatherization professionals. How often do you think this happens, guys? Um, <laughs> I suspect the reason why both the auditor and weatherization crew didn't blow or door test a house with a boiler has nothing to do with their company ethics and everything to do with the Massachusetts utility funded weatherization program, Mass Save, and the extremely risk averse administrators who run the program. As someone who used to be an auditor in the program, I'm now a HERS rater for new construction. I'm familiar with the sometime arbitrary restraints that the program levied. This included things like conducting combustion safety tests in houses with all electric appliances, <laughs> not being able to air seal homes with a solid rock ledge in the basement for fear of lack of vapor control. Some of their risk aversion is also related to economic payback as well. Spray foam insulation and window replacement is heavily discouraged in the mass safe program due to the longer payback periods, as well as foams, potential air quality and fire risk. I think Mass Save's choice to prohibit blower door tests in homes with steam boilers is borderline. It could be confirmed out there that there is no actual asbestos wrap in accessible basements and crawl spaces, but there is a possibility of friable asbestos in a wall cavity that could be pulled into the living space. Even without a blower door test, a good energy auditor should be able to diagnose most air sealing issues using their training and intuition and perhaps an IR camera. With or without a blower door test, we know that air sealing is most crucial in the basement around the rim joist and attic penetrations, including top plates. Those measures get specced in virtually every home, and the upside is that the homeowner pays nothing for it on the front end anyways. The utilities get their share from your utility bill. MassSave tends to avoid paying for air sealing baseboards and window trim and would prefer people get dense-packed cellulose, which has the ability to reduce air movement in those same areas while also adding insulation. A lot of people have complaints about the Mass Save program, but I'm ultimately going to come to its defense because it is consistently ranked as the best energy efficiency program year after year by the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Thanks for making such a great show, and hopefully my next letter won't be so reactionary. <laughs> <laughs> I so, don't know if that's reactionary, Paul. That seemed very measured to me. Yeah. So, Patrick, I don't know if you remember, but uh, right when I left uh, home building last time, I actually went to go work for one of those types of programs in Connecticut. And, um, and you loved it. Well, so the thing is, <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, uh, you know, those programs are very well intentioned, but, you know, because there are these bureaucratic programs, they have some weird things that, that sort of shape the way that these businesses do their work. Uh, Massachusetts, though, I can say the company I worked for moved from Connecticut to Massachusetts because of exactly what he's talking about, about how it is one of the best rated ones in the country. And they do a much better job of trying to integrate the um, the preliminary stuff, which is these these energy audits with the actual contractor work of doing the work with the insulation. Um, because what happens is a lot of times these companies that do the energy audits are tempted to get into the insulation business without having the experience to do it correctly, which is kind of a dangerous situation. But uh, but that I, I had one of those energy audits done on my house even after I worked for the thing. And it's like it's, it's the kind of thing where you pay 100 or 200 bucks and that's your flat fee. They come in, they try to do as much air sealing as they can. So they do a pre-test and a post-test. Uh, blower so, door Rob, test. in your instance, did they actually do a blower door test pre and post? They did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they actually were able to, they were surprised at, at the the amount of, I mean, I know we talked about how leaky my house is, but they actually made it significant, measurably, you know, more airtight with the work that they did around, particularly around rim joists and uh, and uh, some attic situ and closet situations we found. Jeff or Matt, have you guys ever been tempted to get an energy audit on your places and and see what uh, how they do 
Mm. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It'd probably be worth it. I did do a blower door on my house when we bought it. And uh, all I had to do was shove a piece of rigid foam up in my uh, fireplace. And I reduced my ACH by three. <laughs> it went down from <laughs> nine to six just by doing that. So I ended up permanently capping that. Uh, <laughs> Well, that flu. one good reason to actually get those is that in a lot of states, your ability to get these very low interest energy improvement loans hinges on you getting one of those tests. So for me, um, I ended up getting like a 1% interest loan to get the mini splits in my house. And that was based on the fact that I had the energy audit done first. Well, I, I think few people could argue that, you know, weatherization work is probably the best bang for the buck with any construction process you could do to improve your life and your, you know, give, save money so you can spend it on other things in your house instead of, you know, burning fuel, right? For sure. So Jeff, I'm going to come by with a blower door and uh, we're going to test your place. I'm kind of okay. curious how a house of your vintage would do. Would do. Yeah. I bet you I'm, are too. I'm very curious about it, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this comes from Andy in North Carolina. Hi, gang. I have recently been catching up on a backlog of FHB podcasts and have noticed a recurring theme in both podcast offerings, how to work in the construction field and avoid injuries and how to make it safer. Most recently, I've been transitioning from a construction management role with an employer back into my owner modeling a new construction firm. This also comes at a time when I'm learning to work alone or with little help while recovering from sh shoulder surgery. The surgery was a result of a mountain biking accident years ago that left me with a plate and several screws in my collarbone. This repair removed the hardware and fixed some of the damage in the joint, which I suspect was caused by returning to the job too quickly after the initial injury. During this process, there are a few things I learned that I wish I knew were valued when I was younger. I don't claim to be an expert in this, and at 38, feel like I have more aches and pains than I should, which gives me some street cred, I think. He's got some suggestions here. Uh, live a healthy lifestyle outside of work. Eat a decent diet. Do some sort of exercise like jogging, cycling, swimming, or yoga. Something low impact that makes you feel good. Most of the older tradespeople I know are all very active and able to continue to work well into their 60s. Invest in equipment that makes your work easier and safer, such as forklifts, material lifts, cherry pickers, etc. If you can't afford to own it, rent it and build it into the cost of the job. Wear the dang PPE, safety glasses, hearing protection, respirators, fall protection. Just do it and stop acting like you're a tough guy. Be nice to people. Don't force someone who is working for you to do something they aren't comfortable with. If the new guy is afraid of heights, don't force them to go up the ladder. Learn about simple machines and how to use them in your work. Now there is a good article topic. Keep a clean job site. So that is all uh, great info. Uh, Andy goes on a little further, but um, I think that's got the gist of what he was talking about. What do you guys think about that? Do you think if you did all these things that you would hurt less, Rob? Uh, I, I do. I mean, I certainly think that, uh, and I've seen this in younger people as I've been older and feeling all the aches and pains, is that it's so easy when you're young and strong to just be gung-ho. Ah, I can do this. You know, I can carry extra two sheets of plywood instead of one at a time and, uh, um, but also living a healthy lifestyle. I'll tell you, one of the biggest things that I think caused a lot of damage to me when I was a carpenter is not staying hydrated. Because when you're not hydrated, your joints are not as uh, capable of protecting themselves. And I think a lot of the wear and tear on my joints is probably from, you know, when you're busy on a, on a hot summer day in a job site, it's like it, it, we didn't have those gigantic water bottles that everyone seems to carry around now back then as, as, as much. And I, I think that's definitely something I could have done a better job of. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I don't know. It, I know a lot of builders who, you know, live really sort of risky lifestyles outside of the work. I mean, like guys who do, you know, like ice climbing, mountain climbing, you know, high speed, uh, like skidoo racing and stuff. Like that. <laughs> and it's just, it's some of these guys, I mean, they just like to, you know, push everything to the limit. And I mean, it makes sense that, you know, not doing that all the time is going to make your life better in some ways, but also, you know, it makes your life fun. <laughs> right. And you got to blow off steam somehow, right? Especially yeah. if you're a business owner. Oh my God, I can't imagine the stress of being a general contractor. Mm hmm. What do you think, Jeff? What what makes you either be able to do your job into your 60s or not? Um, well, I think 
a lot of it's chemical exposure too, because that I think has a lot of long-term health effects. Like what, man? Well, solvents, um, you know, primarily solvents and using, and using spray paint without a respirator, that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. You think that affects your lungs or you think it affects you in other ways too? Well, I mean, certainly it can cause uh, nerve damage, nerve issues, and but certainly your lungs hmm. and yeah. circulatory issues. All the painters I know are kind of weird, so maybe that has something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Andy, thanks for the thoughts on that. You know, it's something I think a lot about. Uh, I'm very lucky that I didn't, you know, I have had a couple decades to n not be destroying my body after doing it for a couple prior, but... Um, everyone I know who's worked uh, a lifetime in construction uh, definitely has the uh, scrapes and aches and pains to show for it. All right. Do you guys remember Dorian's Corian? Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> do you Matt know anything about that? this, Matt? You don't know about anything about this, do you? I don't think I know about this, no. I did watch the video, though. <laughs> so Barbara, our friend, um, wrote in asking us about how to get the undermount sinks off of Dorian's quarry. And I believe it was her aunt Dorian who gave her these, uh, I don't know, look like a dozen or more uh, bathroom <laughs> countertops with sinks attached. And we had a long discussion about how to do this. And it turned out it was completely unhelpful. It was a complete waste of everyone's time because uh, Barbara figured out that the way we wanted to do it just is impossible. So you ha there is a technique and she figured it out. Um, you actually have to chisel the thing off the off the countertop, right, Rob? Can you d briefly describe her method? Um, I, the, I did. I did not actually see the video. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't describe. I knew the that. That's why I asked you to briefly describe it. <laughs> I didn't do my homework. And the dog Just wanted to it. watch you stammer. <laughs> Matt, I'll let you do it because it was your tool that is the secret to this whole process. Yeah, it was that beehive splitter. That, it's a like a, a what I've called a molding bar, which is like a little flat pry bar, right? Yeah, it's a flat pry bar. The it sort of flares out at the ends pretty wide, so you can you get pretty good purchase on things. But anyway, yeah, she just kind of jammed that and a bunch of other things in that joint and hammered them in and wiggled them around and pried it out. It looked like it took quite a while, but it it worked even at the end. You know, there's just like an inch of the stuff holding on, and that sinks still. You have to pry it out that last little bit. It's, it's incredible how well that thing is stuck to their countertop, right? Yeah, it's insane. Are you, are you talking about one of those uh, like skinny necked uh, pry bars that flares out to like a triangle at the end and it has like a thin, thin, hard blade? Isn't yeah, that what he just said? Of, it's like a, are, yeah, you, are, like you, a, are you tuning into the show? Or are you even on here? It's like a no, I, bar. Well, it's I, about a full I was just clarifying since I hadn't seen the video. I, and I seem to remember that. I was the one who suggested some kind of a thin blade to pry it, pry it off. In the oh, here we go. Episode. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a tool I had mentioned just in another, I think when we were talking about tools that we like, that we use a lot. Yes. Unrelated yeah. I love the this. thing. I, yeah. I, I use it all the time. If you're a remodeler, you have to have one. Yeah. Yes. If you're a carpenter, you have to have one. A finished carpenter, it's, it's so impossibly useful. And apparently you can pry off Korean sinks uh, with it too. <laughs> Barbara, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, Barbara had some thoughts on, um, I, I was describing the you know possible plan to add a carport to our uh, a barn for obviously putting cars under. And she had some thoughts on how I could get around the uh, uh, difficulties I expect to have with the zoning. So... Uh, her solution is a temporary structure. And uh, well, I think we'll talk about that after I talk to my wife about Barbara's hoop house uh, carport. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we got to get some questions. Oh, my goodness. So this is Dave from Easton, Maryland. Hi, podcast crew. I'm a senior project manager at Pekin Design Build in Graysonville, Maryland. I've been struggling this past year with the time, energy, and expense it takes to bring a custom new build and remodel to completion, specifically the last 10% of the job. I see profits drastically descend in the last weeks of a project, so much so I believe a, a job's profitability somewhere hinges on the last 10%. I really want to tackle developing a new paradigm for bringing a job to the finish line, but do not want to reinvent the wheel, meaning I am sure your readers have already tackled this issue. Before I move ahead, I wanted to check if fine home building has ever tackled this issue, and if not, would you be open to making it the theme of a future issue? 
Any feedback and or direction would be greatly appreciated. Well, Dave, we are definitely going to make it a podcast issue. Wow. So this is a fantastic question. Um, and I think Dave is totally right. The, the last 10% of a project takes twice as long as you think it's going to take and costs twice as much. Well, you know, I mean, if you've got clients that are, uh, you know, if this isn't a spec house, if you're talking about a remodel or a new home that's being custom built for somebody, it's dangerous to have the clients walk in right after the drywall goes up because they're like, oh, it's almost done. You know, <laughs> and yeah. you realize that you're like not even halfway done at that point. I, I have thought that myself too. And it is so far from the end, you can't believe it. Yeah. I would say all- you got to charge more, Dave. You know, like, it's and you got to have the right clients who are willing to pay for it. If if you want to do a god good job, you have to pay, have enough. Have to have you have to have charged enough to do a good job. I mean, you know, the, the pricing jobs basically. The more jobs you've done and the, the better records you keep about your costs, the more uh, the better prepared you're going to be to do those kinds of price those prices in the future. And you got to say, hey, you know, if if this is what it cost, if if I if I'm routinely going over by this percentage, um, you know, you just got to kind of put that back in the numbers when you do your bids the next time. I would imagine, but I know it's tough because it's like it's a, it's it's it can be tough depending on your market to to get the numbers that you think you deserve on a job, but uh, but you got to get paid for what you're doing, right? Amen. Yeah. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I all of what you said, and I mean, I don't know, maybe he's you know, front loading payments. I don't know if he, you know, can change the payment schedule in some way. Cause I, I, do, I don't know enough to know exactly what the issue is here, but I mean, and maybe it just comes down to not having, you know, good production methods in place for, you know, doing those final trim details and everything else that, you know, make up the last 10% of the build. And you you also have to wonder, uh, you know, it's, I don't know if we have enough information to really go on, but it's like, uh, you know, at the end, a lot of times you, when clients are starting to see the finished product and um, have the different ideas on where they want it to go, you know, you got to make sure you, you're doing change orders. If there's, you know, sometimes the changes can creep into the job and you think that it's no big deal to just do this one little extra thing here or there. And uh, it's extremely dangerous to do the one little extra thing, I can tell you, because that, and then people start to expect this one extra little thing, and then it's another extra little thing. And it's, I think you got to set expectations right away. Well, this is something that's not agreed upon, so it's going to cost a little more. And uh, you don't have to gouge people, but you do need to charge them for that so they take things seriously. We actually had a webinar on this uh, back uh, when we first went into lockdown about how communication with the client is, um, you know, setting expectations from day one is so key to a six, running a successful business. Uh, I'm trying to look it up. Who? Who was this? It was with uh, Jake Bruton and Jackson Andrews did it. And uh, I'll put a link to that in the podcast. But basically, the key was having certain documents, communication as communication tools to set expectations very clearly from the start of the job and to use to um, communicate any of these changes that happen during the course of the job. Dave, I would say uh, tracking your numbers, as Rob suggested earlier, is really key. You really got to pay attention to what stuff costs, and then you got to really pay attention to um, the the material increases that you know, especially now, have been really dramatic. And of course, things seldom go the other way. So, I mean, your your history for a project two years ago, when you spent two thousand dollars on plumbing fixtures for a kitchen remodel, you know that figure might be three thousand now. Um, so, I mean, you. you you just got to do your homework. And it's it's the part of the job that I think few contractors really like, but it's so important to being successful at it. I can tell you what, from back when I was a lead carpenter, I was in my 20s and I felt pretty confident in my ability to do the, the work. But um, it's, it's so hard to condition yourself to think that um, that you – that you have to spend a certain amount of time on the business end of thing, even during the day while you're on the job site, you know, track, like you said, logging your hours, keeping track of how much materials you used on each step of the project. It's like, it seems like a waste of time when you're trying to get the project done, but it's like, you got to set that time aside every single day to make, to keep those detailed notes. What have you guys seen, uh, 
profitable contractors do with this regard? The, the thing I'm going to start off with is they just charge a ton of money. If they, you know, they're surprised at how expensive things are is what I've heard over and over again. Yeah. It's tough, you know, it's tough, but it's essential to, to, to be a good business person. Yeah. Her next question comes from Jim Collins. Uh, Jim Collins is a landscape architect in Burlington, Ontario, and Jim was on uh, our Pro Talk uh, podcast, episode 282. It was interesting to talk to him. I had no idea how many hats that landscape architects wear. He says, I have a question for your crew in order to finish out my shed. The shed is, a, is two by four stud construction on a concrete slab with two by six roof rafters, asphalt shingles, and it's clad with LP smart side panels. My question relates to window installation. I would like to use vinyl inset insert windows, excuse me, vinyl insert windows from Habitat for Humanities Restore that has, they have no nailing flanges. Since the LP smart site panels are not just siding, but also the shear strength and shear strength, I want to know how you would recommend putting in this window. I was thinking of building a sill with PVC or composite type material and would like to trim around the window with five quarter stock like my doors and corners. How do I flash it? Caulking? I want to stress that I don't have one foot overhangs on that side. I've attached a video link of the build project and some pictures of the window and exterior and the shed's exterior as well. Thanks again for the awesome privilege of being on the Pro Talk podcast. I would gladly join your team anytime if either landscape questions come up that I can assist with. Well, Jim, we will keep you in mind for that. So folks, if you have any landscaping questions, Jim's on the line. You know, you know, I often think that we don't cover enough landscaping. We kind of leave that to the gardening magazine. Uh, but landscaping, I'm quite can be... content to do that, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll, well I'll you do can that. do that. <laughs> yeah. You've got it in house. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so you know, the whole concept of air sealing and WRBs has been in place since you know sort of after everyone's accustomed to using flange style windows but you got that you got to remember i mean years and years ago the flange style windows were were kind of a new thing i mean you know windows were just getting nailed to the inside of the framing uh, but now with the age of uh water you know water and uh, air management um i mean there are people have come up with methods like that based on a lot of these european windows that don't have uh flanges and it's it's a lot about taping to the sides of the windows as they go into the jam. Um, but then again, in a shed, do we really need to worry about it? If you've got that, that kind of siding, I don't know. I don't, I mean, what I did with my shed is I basically just built the trim, you know, to basically extend into the rough opening a little bit, you know, so, and then the window sashes themselves just lay against the trim and, you know, that's what keeps them from falling out. They're not even fastened in in any way. There's just one screw that I drove up to the, through the top you know, I slope the sill. And so the whole thing is sort of captured in there just with that between the trim and that one screw. And Can I paraphrase? So you made your trim. So it laps onto the, uh, insert right into the set onto the sash. And then mm -hmm. the sash is pressed against that. Yeah. And that just, you know, that alone with that one screw and the sloped sill is enough to hold the thing in there. I mean, you have to get the rough opening, you know, almost perfect. perfect. Yeah. To, for this to work, but it, it's not a lot of work. So but for a shed, I think that works fine. Fantastic. And, you know, I would recommend, you know, something similar to that for him. Um, I do have, you know, I made sure that I had decent size overhangs for this though. Um, you know, he just has to do some additional flashing maybe that, you know, I didn't have to do. <laughs> It's important to keep in mind that the, the shed is going to dry, right? Because it, yeah. it's, it, it's going to dry on the inside. It's going to dry toward the outside. There's you know no finished materials to prevent drying. So I think that's key. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I, the shear resistance, I mean, he could just, you know, if use some metal strapping, you know. Or lead embracing, right? Or lead embracing. Yeah. I was going to suggest make a uh, box of one by to the exact uh, dimensions of the perimeter of the inset window and screw it much like you would in its original intent as a replacement window through the sides of the window into this three quarter stock box. And then you put casing on the outside of the box. And if, in essence, you have created what I would describe as a flanged window, right? You've made this kind of L-shaped arrangement that the uh, the window 
replacement window is screwed to, and then you put this whole assembly in the hole. Yeah. And maybe that's more complicated than you need to get, but I do think it's going to make it easier to have a rough opening and have a slightly undersized, you know, uh, window going in there. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you what I what I did on my shed because um, I've got one of those store bought sheds on my property that had the cheap little flange windows that were just nailed to the outside of it. But then I put a nicer window in at one point, and I actually based it on how I detailed my barn when I built my barn. Uh, I looked at a lot of the barns in my neighborhood and realized that a lot of them had nice sa- window sashes with no trim whatsoever. What they would do is they would run the siding right over the uh, rough opening. So that the the window would contact the back of the siding, and then they would just let in a sill to the siding over the uh, the you know the bottom of the rough opening that would penetrate the the siding and and you and pitch any water that got past the window out. And the nice thing about that is you can make the rough opening oversized and uh, just make make the opening in the siding. Uh, small enough that you've got plenty of room to lap the the edge of the window over it. I think, uh, you know, it would be possible to overthink this gym because it is a shed and, uh, the drying that you're going to get is, you know, everything. If, if you were trying to do this in your house, it get, the details are way more important. Yeah. Our next question comes from Roger in Charleston, South Carolina. Ahoy podcast team. I don't know if we've ever had that salutation, have we? (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like a sailor. I don't know if he knows what show he's writing into, but okay. (laughs) I've been listening to the podcast since the beginning and a a big fan of both it and the magazine. I am remodeling a 1970s ranch and opening up the floor plan. This is not my first project, and I'm hoping to further hone my skills in construction and project management on this project so I can get a remodeling business moving before I retire from my second career. This house, like many of its kind, was very low budget, a very low budget build and has paneling instead of drywall on the walls. My question is, what are the options for trimming the windows when I remove the paneling and install drywall? It seems like a ton of work installing a half inch jam extension and prepping for paint, but I don't see any other way out. Now, on the topic of becoming a skilled, well, let's, let's answer that first. Do you guys think of, can you think of a way that we could pull off the paneling, put up drywall on its place without extending the window and door jams to do so. Yes. Okay. Not a great one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he could put two buys next to the king studs sort of on the flat. So you've got the stud, you put another one there and then you just case right on that. You know, it's flush with the, uh, with the window frame. How are you going to air seal you, that? Well, that's the thing. So then you got to caulk around all that. I mean, you're going to have all the paneling off. You're going to go around. You're going to air seal your all of your plates and everything. I hope while you're at, you know, doing all that work. Um, but then I was. Can, I didn't even think of that. You have to get really <laughs> fat cased, like really thick casing, and then you can case. And then the the pain in the ass part of it is getting the drywall up to that and finishing that joint <laughs> where the drywall is butting in. But you have attachment for the for that edge on that two by on the flat. Um, you know, so you're saying, you're saying, but the drywall to the side of the casing is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the way an old plaster house is done, you know, like my house. Yes. And you can get those tear off strips for taping that edge, which wouldn't be too bad. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was my first thought, but you know, I don't know that that's going to be less work than just ripping a bunch of half inch extension jams. Yeah. And so, I was going to say that ripping the extension jams and putting them on is not that much work. And I think you all would agree that, you know, I try and make things as easy as possible most times. But I also thought about what about if you had, you know, overly thick casing, could you wrap it, the drywall side of it, so it had, you know, so it lapped onto the drywall, which is now proud of the window jam. Does that seem like a viable solution? Yeah, yeah, or, or you can just make an L out of that trim and, you know, yes. make, do the trim itself. You know, so like you apply the, the extension jam to the casing, not the, the window uh, jam, right? Right, yeah. Or even, you know, I, I bet you could find some kind of trim pre, pre-cut that you could just do a built-up casing. Leave the drywall back a, a tad and use like stops or cove or some other small molding instead of ripping uh, so you're saying put a casing on and then a band around the outside perimeter of the casing to uh, for or, additional thickness around the inside perimeter. So leave the, you know, 
to to bridge that gap instead of making dry, um, extension jams from scratch maybe if you leave this drywall back enough you can uh you can basically just fill bridge that gap with some pre-made piece of trim hmm. jeff do you have any thoughts on this nothing that hasn't been talked about yeah. I say just suck it up and put some extension jams on there. there, there there's a reason the casing, you know, hides wall finishes and window jams is because it makes it easier down the road, right? Like you, yep. you don't have, things don't have to be perfect. If you're talking about butting the drywall up to the casing or rabbiting the casing, things got to be pretty close. Or, or, you, or you could just do it like that. I, I think I told you guys about that motel I was I stayed in once where they just ran the drywall right over the the uh, jams to the doors and put the casing on afterwards so you could see the rough edge of the drywall between the jam and the casing. <laughs> <laughs> just paint it. <laughs> I would describe that using one of my favorite words from Rodney, our art director. That is janky. That is completely <laughs> janky. And I'm not even sure what, I know well, what that on. means, but yeah. that is it. You could just bridge the gap with some caulk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you just bond the finished that, edges that of the exposed drywall. edge. It'll, yeah. It'll be much nicer. Yeah, man. Roger, just 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 pull the band-aid off and fix that. Yep. That's it. So uh, Roger goes on to say, uh, now on the topic of becoming a skilled tradesperson, I think you can look no further than the US Navy's construction battalion. They tra train seemingly every trade to build an airport, so I would imagine those skills transfer to residential construction. Sure, not everyone wants to leave home, take on the military, and see the world experience, but I've known several who did and are much better people for it. I think all five branches of the armed services have some sort of solid, proven, trade-specific training. This type of experience, with, when combined with a proven work ethic and abundance of flexibility, should make these people highly valuable in the civilian world. I can personally vouch for the Navy Seabees after working with them during my Coast Guard days. I have added a couple links from YouTube with more information about the Seabees. Thanks in advance for your help, and let Brian know if he needs any volunteer help with keeping craft alive here in Charleston, please let me know. Well, that was fantastic, well, Roger. So, so, Matt, what about the Seabees? Uh, they're fantastic. I mean, back when I was in Afghanistan in 2009 was my first time over there. And uh, I spent some time in Helmand when the Seabees were building up what became Camp Leatherneck, uh, which was like the main Marine base down there. But it was basically just a moonscape when I was down there the first time. And they had built probably just maybe two or three bee huts at the time. And it was just like, you know, what's this, a bee hut? Sorry. Uh, it's a kind of building. It's basically just a, a very simple wood framed structure. A lot of Are these largely prefab uh, that they bring on in, in panels no, or something. No, they're just building them on site, you know, with mm. two by fours and plywood. And uh, yeah, they were fantastic. Anyway. So I was back in that same place about a year, year and a half later. And it was like a city just of like bee huts. As far as the eye could see, <laughs> roads uh you know paved uh airport and it was insane but yeah the cbs are fantastic and i don't know that all the services have it i doubt space force has uh their version yet <laughs> <laughs> and i, I kind of doubt that they'd be building wood frame structures but the army does have a 12 whiskey um i never actually saw one of those guys actually building anything but i know they exist well, I can tell you, Matt, uh, there's something that sort of bridges your experience with that and your other experience in, in journalism. When I search for uh, like do, um, free images online, to, when I just need something generic about a construction site, there are thousands and thousands of photos from those military construction teams. They Matt probably to, took some of those. They seem to document every <laughs> single thing they do, because if you search for anything in Wiki, Wikimedia Commons that's related to construction, you will find tons of their tons of their work. Yeah. I mean, they have tons of bulldozers. I mean, the Army obviously has their engineers. I mean, they're building all kinds of stuff all the time. So I I think it's a great suggestion. And I was I don't know if you guys looked at the videos that Roger sent, but I was completely captivated of the footage of them uh, assembling a base in Antarctica. Uh, it was <laughs> Cool. <laughs> it looked like hard work, but you know. Yeah, Neat. I got to watch those. I didn't. I didn't click on those yet. So yeah. we'll put those on the podcast page for those of you who are interested. Um, and you know, I didn't watch them because I didn't do my homework. <laughs> <laughs> the mediocrity is very strong with you today, hey, WhatsApp. Uh, actually, no. I, I'm going to use that as a segue. You know what I was doing all, all night last night was uh, 
our kitchen and bath issue it just went live and uh it doesn't magically appear on the website i actually have to you know publish all those articles on the website so that's what i was doing last night instead of preparing for your podcast sorry so what were you doing all during the day when you should have been doing this and then you had to do at night that's what i would ask lee (laughs) (laughs) hey i'm a busy guy i got a lot of stuff to publish on that website uh so I, I will give thumbs up to the kitchen and bass issue. There is a ton of good stuff in there. And if you all are trying to build a kitchen on 12 grand, didn't think that's possible, it's in there. Somebody done it. And it's a nice kitchen too. It is not janky. Yeah. You know, there's another article in there that I was surprised by, uh, po- the polyurethane grout article, Peter Yost's article comparing epoxy and polyurethane grout. I think polyurethane grout, I think I only picture that as in public bathrooms, right? Where they need these like super durable waterproof um, grouts by by code, I believe, right? Um, and apparently people use it in residential bathrooms and it's pretty tough, durable, easy to work with stuff. So, yeah. I'm a, you know, I'm a huge fan of cement grout. That's like goes back to Roman times. You know, why mess with a good thing? <laughs> because it's old. And- <laughs> inferior it stains and yeah <laughs> right i get it all right so this comes from jim you've spoken many times about using smoke to check for air leaks but all i can find when i look for smoke pencils etc is stuff that costs 40 dollars and up for a kit is there a cheaper method for generating smoke that doesn't stink no incense no cigarettes all right rob what do you got what do i got I didn't do my homework. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just delighting in putting you on the spot every time. Oh, the smoke pens. They, there's got to be ones cheaper than that, right? What do you know, Matt? I'm going to go to someone who's actually done some work. Uh, well, there's a couple things. One, you can, I wouldn't actually do this, but you can mix uh, ammonia and uh, hydrochloric acid. <laughs> oh, good. So you can chlorine gas yourself while you're sealing yeah, your air leaks that, yeah, okay they, i would do that you know, before that, you air seal that's a common experiment they do in <laughs> chemistry classes you know usually under a, a some kind a of hood a fume, a fume hood to make <laughs> <Yes>. sure <laughs> but it's kind of cool um no but there's a bunch of toys out there that make smoke i mean you could get a toy train you know with one of those little smoke uh emitter things if you wanted to just, you know, goof around with it. There's also... I don't think those things are illegal anymore. It's been a long time since we were kids, Matt. I, yeah, I, <laughs> I think you might still be able to find it. But I did see, I found a, a toy sort of gun, a zero blaster vapor vortex generator. <laughs> I get zero that. Toys, and it like shoots little smoke rings that you can, <laughs> you could use God. for this. No, I... Is that sold with a bag of glass? But I think it uses the same stuff probably as the smoke pencil. I think it's just, you know, just a different delivery device. So I've heard that the kind of chemical smokes are bad for you, and I forget what the compounds are, but I remember um, uh, some of my folks who know a lot more about weatherization work telling me that you, you shouldn't use those because they are bad for you. I think the only thing that's safe to use are these glycerin boilers, right, which is the $40 thing he's talking about. And it's exactly what it costs. I looked it up on Amazon today. It's called a smoke pencil. Yeah. And you fill it with glycerin. It's got a little heating element. And because glycerin has such a low evaporation point, it, it makes steam. It makes vapor w- yeah. with the heat of this little electric element that's battery powered. I think that's the same stuff in like those vape pens. Maybe you just need to take up vaping. Or even if you don't take up vaping, <laughs> I bet you go into the vape store and be like, what vape pen doesn't stink? You know, what? what yeah. is the, Yeah. They make non-nicotine versions. You can get like a bubble gum, bubble gum flavored one. We're going to get all of our <laughs> listeners like nicotine addicted. And I don't think we should do yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. We're talking about, you know, making poison gas, vaping. <laughs> yeah. You guys are giving and some he, great We advice. should just tell him to use cigarettes like he doesn't want to use. <laughs> uh, so I, I can't so remember for the life of me, but I question. feel like, what? Is, would soap bubbles work for this application? If you could get one of those bubble wands, would it? Do they have enough buoyancy to actually show air, air leaks? Of course, they're going to show huge ones, but are they going to show smaller leaks too? This is a question for the podcast tribe out there. Is this going to work? What do you guys think? Uh, maybe if you had really tiny bubbles. I mean, you could use like so, a steamer if he wanted. If he's not worried about getting water in those walls, right. <laughs> so I think I, the steamer is going to be more expensive though than the smoke pencil by a yeah, factor, right? Yeah. But if you have one laying around, it'll do. Like we all do. Yeah. <laughs> we all live in the fifties. <laughs> I, 
feel like Peter Yost was doing something on this in one of his blogs on on GBA about some tools to use. And I, I'm pretty sure there's some sort of like powder puff things that are almost almost like a talcum powder kind yeah. of uh, a, a bulb that you squeeze to get some powder to puff out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to have to have some people chime in in the in the um, email, email us with suggestions. But I'll do I'll do some research because I, I if I had done my homework, I probably would have had a good answer for this. Yeah, like a fingerprinting. Oh, that's that's kit. profound. One of those little bulbs <laughs> in a fingerprinting kit. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to Liam more and more. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time to ask Barbara. <laughs> yeah, Barbara, what compounds can you use to like simulate smoke? And that's a, that's a good question. I would also think like if you could get some kind of like candy confection that's steamy, right? If you could like, you know, get some hard candy or caramel on the, on the stove that it's boiling off and you get some steam and you could walk around with that and make your house smell nice and then you could make some fudge when you were all done. What do you think? Sure. You guys are looking at me like I got two heads. <laughs> just walk around with a hot cup of coffee. Yeah. Just stick that up there. Right. Steam. Yeah. We need some kind of something that shows air movement. Yeah. If any of you have any ideas, I was going to say like matches when you light them and then blow them out, you get a pretty good, you know, uh, trail of smoke, but that might not be what he's after. He doesn't want his house to stink. And I get that too, but it seems like the, the sulfur compounds from a match seem to dissipate pretty quickly. Am I, am I wrong about that? Yeah. Or no, I mean, no, you're not wrong about it. <laughs> or, um, I mean, I guess you could hold a candle up and see if it blows in the wind, but, uh, oh man, that sounds like a song. <laughs> oh man i don't know we're gonna have to ask the uh podcast listeners for help with this i mean i don't think 40 bucks is unreasonable what do you guys think is that no that seems I've, like a... I've, I've seen a few of them cheaper than that like not much cheaper but uh i'm, I'm searching and searching I, I know there's these little smoke powder things maybe you can just carry, carry a little thing of talcum powder around and squeeze it and puff that out yeah mm. That would I don't make know. A mess I'm at sure. All. I, What's know that? The, <laughs> I know in the past I've seen like DIY smoke pencils, but I don't know how much it costs those guys to make them. You know, I'm sure Barbara's probably made one. It's, oh, yeah, she's I mean, probably it's like cool. got an Etsy site with them. Yeah. I mean, you just got to create some sort of little resistance coil and then dump some glycerin on it and bingo, bingo. That's it. It's a vape pen. Yeah, you're making well, a little vapor. And, and, and doesn't like vape liquid have a lot of glycerin? Isn't, isn't that one of the things that's, that's, that's in there? That's why yeah. it's, it's exactly the same thing as far as I know. I don't think you're going to get a vape pen uh, less than 40 bucks, though, is my guess. But I, I once again, I could be wrong. What I don't know about that is everything. Yeah. Huh, well, oh, there. I was going to suggest a smudge stick, but that's probably not what he's into either. Do you guys know what this is? It's like. Yeah, for like. Uh blessing the a new home or something like that right it's, yeah uh, it's, a, it's a ritual in my family that makes it stink for a couple days yeah mm -hmm. what you need is a catholic priest oh my god an incense burner incense. yeah well, he specifically go. said no incense yeah <laughs> yeah right i didn't read that part <laughs> maybe maybe you can find some of that unscented incense <laughs> yeah. uh so I, I just wanted to share, and I know Rob didn't see this photograph, but uh, one of my Facebook <laughs> friends put up a photograph of a table in, I, in the Orange Home Center that said thousand pound capacity. And there was 800 pounds of concrete mix on this completely smashed table. It was hilarious. <laughs> what was it? it looked like a DeWalt table that had just completely collapsed under the... <laughs> 200 pounds less than it's supposed to holding capacity. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and what I love is that no one, nobody bothered to pick this disaster up. They just left it on the floor. Right. And it was just like, Oh, so good. I bet your buddy just pushed the thing over to take the picture <laughs> or he sat on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> See, I thought you were going to talk about the overloaded pickup truck picture that you guys were. Yeah. That was another around one. This morning. <laughs> so somebody had, what looked like a pretty significant amount of uh, dimensional lumber that stuck beyond the tailgate several feet, right? They stuck had... Stuck all the way up to the top of the bed. Like the bed was full of dimensional lumber. And then they had like what looked to be like a unit of plywood or, or three quarter inch OSB on top of that. And and were there other things on there too? There, there were... Yeah, there was a... It was stacked higher than the roof of the truck, whatever it was. Let's yeah. just say that there was no rear suspension travel and the front wheels looked like they were about to lift off the ground. 
Yeah. But they were careful. I mean, they strapped it. They put a strap <laughs> <on> it. <laughs> all right. So of all the people uh, listening who own pickup trucks, how many of you have never overloaded your truck? I don't know. I mean, I've done it at least a couple of times. But the, the point that Matt made earlier, I think it was Matt, uh, was that if you're getting that much material, most building supply yards will deliver it for a modest fee. If he if never not. gives me credit for anything, Matt. Yeah, that was, it was Patrick who said it. But I mean, even even the box stores now will deliver stuff for you. Yeah, and you and, and as much stuff was, that was on that truck, it's like they might charge a fee for like under five hundred dollars worth of material, but it's it doesn't take that much material to get up to five hundred dollars these days. And I think once you get up to those higher numbers, they'll deliver it for free most places. Yeah, and what do a set of shocks and leaf springs cost for an F-150? It's got probably those airbags that are going to cost thousands of dollars to replace. And plus, you might not make it home because you're not going to be able to steer or stop. Yeah. Well, you're not going to be able to stop when the cops try to pull you over because you're driving unsafe. <laughs> I, forgive me if I've told you guys this before, but when I worked at the lumber yard, we had the police stop in at the lumber counter one morning. And they're like, uh, they actually called. And they said... Um, you guys got a truck coming by. It's overloaded. We're sending it back to the yard. And we're all looking at each other like, well, we pay attention to how much weight is on the trucks because you absolutely have to. You can't afford to have to offload a truck because it's overloaded. It's just not, it's false economy, right? So we were all kind of mystified, like what driver left the yard and how did he get too much stuff on his truck? In fact, when we would do invoices, it would keep track of the weight of the things on the list of material. So we put, add this all together and the dispatcher would know how much it, weight was on the truck to a pretty accurate degree. So this guy comes in and we expect it to be one of our trucks, but it's this like very, very beat up one ton, like Mason's dump truck. <laughs> and this guy has like green rough sawn lumber, like stacked above the roof of this truck. And it was so overloaded, it was unbelievable. So he had to pay us to use our equipment to offload half of his truck <laughs> onto the ground so then he could come back and make a second trip to get the rest of it. But it was the most dangerous thing I'd ever seen. And I asked the guy, I was like, why did you even attempt this? You, you're not going to make it home without killing yourself. And he's like, well, once most of it was on there and there was only about three or four feet left, I just decided to put the rest on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah, man. <laughs> yep. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thanks to Matt, Rob, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Thanks again for listening, folks. Happy building and keep craft alive.